Hello, readers. Today we're going to continue chapter five of By the Great Horn Spoon. So as you know, it takes place during the California Gold Rush. And yesterday we learned what happens when they left the port of Rio and kept going around the Cape. So we're on chapter five, chap titled Land of Fire. Almost without warning, the first storm came roaring off the Arctic waste and bore down on the paddle wheeler. The sun went out like a match. Long, shrieking winds loaded with hailstones struck the ship like a, like a cannon. The oak wheel spun out of the hands of the quartermaster. The Lady Wilma went teetering off her side, digging her ribs deep into the seas. Jack, who had just sat down to a bowl of chowder, saw the bowl fly off in one direction, the chowder in another, and the spoon in a third. Have you ever had chowder before? It's like a soup with a milk base in it, like clam chowder. I do believe we've arrived off the horn, said Praiseworthy, hanging onto his bowler hat. Captain Swain lent a hand to the wheel, riding the ship and turning her bow spirit into the wind. In the main saloon, the gold seekers had been thrown together in a tangle of arms and legs. No sooner did they unravel themselves when another violent lurch of the ship knotted them together again. The ship's bell rang in the wind. Howling blasts ripped off the tops of the waves. Riding the swells, the Lady Loma seemed to climb halfway into the sky, only to drop with a crash on the troughs. Jack got wild glimpses of the sea through a porthole, as if he was afraid he was too busy hanging on to give it too much thought. The side wheeler burrowed into the storm. Seawater came rushing along the decks and slipped down the hatches like waterfalls. Sailors in their caps were busy everywhere, battening the hatches and taking in rags of canvas. Wow, this storm sounds kind of scary. Jack's hammock swayed and the cabin wall swung. If Mr. Azaria Jones was pitched out of his bunk, it was Dr. Buckby. More than once, Mountain Jim awoke to find them both sprawled across him. I've known grizzly bears that were might friendlier than this Billy B. Cape Horn. Headwinds battled on the paddle wheeler to a complete standstill and Jack began to wonder if they would ever reach the Pacific. The Lady Wilma was thrashing with all of her steam to stay in one place. But then a calm would set in like a great practical joke. The, mem the moment passengers began to snore in their cabins, fresh winds would swoop down and jerk the ship awake. There will be nothing to do but sleep when we reach the Pacific, said Jack. The portholes were almost frozen over, and only once did Jack get a glimpse of, a, of land. Dark cliffs seemed to hang like draperies in the misty sky and then the water the weather closed in again and they were gone do you think there's any chance we might catch up with the sea raven jack asked hanging on to his hammock we could pass with a hundred yards of each other without knowing it praiseworthy said we can't get to San Francisco soon enough to suit me, put in Mr. Azaria Jones. I hope we win the race, said Jack. I don't think Captain Swain has the slightest intention of losing the race, said Praiseworthy. For 37 days, the side wheeler battered and rammed her way through the crashing headwinds that attempted to drive her back. And then on a Tuesday morning, the sun broke out, clear and sharp, and hung like an ornament in the northern sky. 
one by one the deck hatches opened and the gold seekers came on deck as if from a dark dungeon. Their eyes blinked in the unfamiliar brightness of the day. We made it, yelled Mountain Jim, throwing down his yellow fur caps. Boys, this here is the Pacific Ocean. A yell went up around the ship and Captain Swain leaned out of the pilot house. His beard had grown an inch. He gave a hearty wave and then came out on the paddle box with his long glass. After a moment of sweeping the seas, he stopped. By grabs, he roared. There she is, the sea raven, and she's ahead of us. Another yell went up, and the gold seekers rushed to look. There was the sea raven. Indeed, it seemed to Jack the most exciting moment of his life. And then oh, they pulled ahead and the sea ro raven was trailing far behind. Woo! yelled everyone. A remarkable performance. Yes, and a remarkable performance indeed, said Praiseworthy, but he was baffled. It seemed hardly possible that the Lady Wilma had charged against the furies of the past 37 days, and yet there stood the sea raven behind them as proof. I watched for the fires, said Jack, but I never did catch sight of them, praiseworthy. Suddenly, the butler's eyes lit up. <gasps> Why, Master Jack, you solved it! Solved what? You didn't see the fires of Tierra del Fuego because they weren't to be seen. But you said, I mean to say, the fires were there, but we were not. At that moment, Captain Swain had joined the gold seekers on the deck. Jack had never seen him with such a wide, merry smile glowing from the depths of his whiskers. I hope you gentlemen enjoyed your passage around the horn. Captain, Praiseworthy said with a gleam in his eye, Master Jack appears to be on to your secret. Secret, what's that? We haven't been around the horn, sir. Captain Swain gave Jack a twinkling glance. Is that so, lad? Uh, all I said was, said Jack. What he means is that you have pulled off a most daring piece of seamanship, sir, interrupted the butler. The reason Master Jack didn't catch sight of the great fires at Land's End, why, the reason, sir, is that we took the Lady Wilma through the deadly Strait of Magellan. Readers, do you remember yesterday? We saw the map and we thought they were going all the way below the horn. But the author, I have goosebumps, the author tricked us. Oh, what a great writer that author is. They actually went through the strait. Don't you love that? That's like a twist. Have you ever watched a movie and then there's an interesting twist at the end? Writers can do that too. They gave us a twist. So they went through the, the center, remember? Oh my, wow. The Strait of Magellan, you say? The captain rubbed his plump nose. Why, that's a regular ship's graveyard. And then he gave Jack a heavy squint. Of course, it cuts hundreds of miles off the voyage around the horn hundreds of miles. A ship's master can be tempted. You mean to say, sir, said Mr. Azaria Jones, turning pale, that we've been bouncing around in that awful place? <laughs> I confess, chuckled the captain. The lad here has found me out. Then he pointed to the sea raven. Look at her following us, gentlemen, like a chicken after a rooster. 
And I'll stop there for chapter six. Did you see that coming? I did not. That was a great twist in the book. Whew. I can't wait to fi find out what happens next. They must almost be to California. See you next time.